Good afternoon and welcome to today's industry presented webinar, The Importance of Measuring Aerobic Capacity Among the General Population. A few housekeeping things before we get started. This is a voice over IP webinar, meaning it's totally web-based. If you experience audio difficulties or if the video begins to buffer, it's likely caused by the strength of your internet signal. If you are having issues, log off and log back on. If you do have a question during the webinar, please type it in the question area within the GoToWebinar navigation, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the presentation. If your question goes unanswered, we'll take additional questions from today's webinar and post answers as a blog on the ACSM website. We also encourage you to join the conversation about today's webinar on Twitter by using the hashtag ACSMWebinar. Today's webinar is sponsored and presented by Technogym. Technogym is a world leader in the fitness and wellness solution sector and has equipped more than 65,000 wellness centers and more than 100,000 homes worldwide. An estimated 35 million people use Technogym products every day in more than 100 countries worldwide. One continuing education credit, or CEC, courtesy of Technogym, will be mailed to all participants after the webinar you should receive the CEC email and a link to the presentation within the next one to two days. There is no need to email ACSM asking about CEC credit. Today's webinar presenter is Dr. Jonathan Myers. Dr. Myers is a health research scientist at the Palo Alto Veteran Affairs Healthcare System, where he directs the Exercise Research Laboratory. He is a clinical professor of medicine at Stanford University and a Research Career Scientist Award recipient through the Veterans Affairs Rehabilitation Research and Development Program. His 30-year body of research has focused on clinical applications of exercise testing and training in patients with chronic heart failure, physical activity and cardiovascular health, and the epidemiology of exercise test responses and physical activity patterns. It is with great pleasure that we present to you Dr. Jonathan Myers. Here. Um, I'm uh, speaking from Bologna, Italy, and I'm at the end of a two week European tour uh, that's taken me from Vienna to, to Rome and Ferrara and now Bologna. And uh, Techno Jim asked me to uh, add this on, so I'm, I'm happy to do this and, and thank you for the invitation. Um, they asked me to talk about the importance of measuring aerobic capacity in the general population. And that's going to be my main topic. But the principles of aerobic capacity and its association with health outcomes apply to both patients with chronic conditions as well as the general relatively healthy population. So I'm going to switch the slide here as soon as I can. There we go. Um, some of this is based on, um, I, I think, this important scientific statement that uh, was released about a year and a half ago from the American Heart Association. And it's called The Importance of Assessing Cardiorespiratory Fitness in Clinical Practice, a Case for Fitness as a Clinical Vital Sign. And Bob Ross, as you can see, was the person that headed up this uh, writing group that I was part of. And the idea here, or the impetus behind this, is the fact that studies over the last two to three decades epidemiologic studies, that is, have shown that fitness is a more powerful risk factor than the traditional risk factors, such as hypertension, smoking, uh, lipid abnormalities, obesity, and the things we usually think about. So we want to get healthcare providers to think about fitness, measuring it, uh, using it as in the risk paradigm for, for the general public and patients with heart disease. So, um, much of what I'm going to talk about is really based in this um, statement, and I'd recommend for those of you interested in getting a hold of uh, this statement and reading it, it's available on the AHA website. Um, so I'll talk about these things. Uh, why should fitness be a vital sign? And fitness is a more powerful risk factor, as I said, than the traditional risk factors, at least in many of the epidemiologic studies the last two to three decades. Why should we encourage our patients in the public to be to become more physically active. 
fitness provides risk information beyond the traditional risk factors. And there's some new statistics that have been applied that um, we and others have used to um, look at just where fitness fits in the traditional risk paradigm. So we'll take a look at that. Um, I want to say a few words about fitness and healthcare costs. Um, that's something that I've been interested in for some years now, and we have um, several recent publications in this area. So I'll talk about some of that data. Um, all right, so fitness, uh, this issue of fitness is a more powerful predictor of risk than the traditional risk factors. We'll start with this. This is a, a publication that comes from a Lancet a few years ago. There was an issue of Lancet that was dedicated completely to worldwide physical inactivity and health. And this is one study from that issue that got a lot of attention in the media. And what caught people's attention was this idea over on the right side, you can see the global deaths per year. For the first time, they're actually thought to be higher for physical inactivity than for smoking. As many of you know, smoking, at least in advanced countries, has been decreasing for many years although it remains a problem in many developing countries. But overall, worldwide, physical inactivity is thought to account for more deaths per year than smoking for the first time. And then if you look over on the left side, the prevalence of inactivity is now thought to be higher than it is for smoking. So that surprised a lot of people. These are some data from Steve Blair, who, um, as, as I'm sure all of you know, is a renowned epidemiologist, and he's been um, addressing this issue for three or four decades. And I think this is an important slide from some, some of the uh, aerobic center longitudinal uh, study data. Um, it shows the attributable fractions for all cause deaths among the usual risk factors. And you can see obesity, smoking, hypertension, lipid abnormalities, and diabetes. But over on the left side, you see the attributable fractions for all cause deaths are higher for low fitness than they are for the traditional risk factors. And that surprises a lot of clinicians and healthcare providers who usually treat lipid abnormalities with a statin, or we give ACE inhibitors for hypertension, or we send patients to a smoking cessation program. We treat those traditional primary risk factors, but we tend to ignore low fitness. And so one of the things behind or one of the motivations behind the AHA scientific statement that we tried to get across was we should be paying more attention to low fitness. In fact, if you look at this, if you were to combine obesity, lipid abnormalities or high cholesterol and diabetes together, they wouldn't add up to the attributable fraction of deaths that are due to low fitness. Right, and these are some data uh, from our lab, um, our, our follow-up study that we started in 1987 that we affectionately call the Veterans Exercise Testing Study, or VETS. Um, this is something that we published in the New England Journal some years ago. But it shows the relative risk for mortality on the left side or the y-axis there. And then on the bottom are the quintiles of exercise capacity with the fittest subjects over on the right side showing those with disease in the green and normal subjects in the blue. And what this shows is that whether or not you have disease, if you're in that lowest fit group, you have more than four times the risk for mortality when compared to the fittest subjects. The other thing that you can see here is this decline, this gradient for a decline in mortality as your fitness becomes higher. The other thing that you notice, and this is something that Dr. Blair and others have made for many years, and it's consistent with our data over the years as well, especially if you look at the normal subjects in the blue there on the left side. If you look at the least fit group and you go to the next least fit group, you cut your risk by 50%. So many studies have shown that the greatest amount of benefit occurs when you compare the least fit group and the next least fit group. So getting patients out of that least fit group is very important, and I'll come back to this in a moment. The other thing that I think is important is that over the years, we've found that exercise capacity is our most powerful predictor of risk, and we've found that to be the case over and over when we look at the a combination of other risk factors that 
that we have. And at the VA, where I do this, this work, um, our population has a very rich mixture of, of smoking and diabetes and overweight and you know all of the usual risk factors. So it's a good population to look at things like this with. The other thing is that we find that there's a 10 to 20% reduction in risk per MET achieved on a treadmill test. And as most of you know, the MET, the one MET is that small increment in exercise capacity that we always use, that three and a half roughly mLs per kg per minute increment in fitness. It's two and a half percent grade on the treadmill or maybe 25 watts, depending on your body weight on a, uh, on a cycle ergometer. So a small increment or an improvement in fitness can go a long way. And these are some, um, uh, some data from the VA as well. When we measure peak VO2 directly here, in this case, you have the relative risk for mortality on the left side. And that first group is the least fit group. That's using measured VO2 less than 17.5 mLs per kg per minute or less than 5 mets. And as many of you know, also know that 5 mets has, is sort of an iconic cutoff over the years for uh, to indicate a group that's poorly fit or high risk. And that five met cut point was established back in the CAS studies in the late 1970s and early 80s, where they showed that regardless of any of your other risk factors, if you achieved less than five mets, didn't matter whether you got bypass surgery or not, or what your other ischemic responses were, you were at high risk. So we use that as a low fit group. And as you can see, you go from the less than five met group to the next group, five to seven mets. Just getting out of that low fit group, you cut your risk in half. If you go to the next group, seven to nine mets, and then nine to 11 mets, you cut your risk further. And in this study, you see over on the right side, subjects who are more than 11 mets, that's the fittest group. We didn't have any deaths in that group, at least for this given seven-year follow-up. And I always say when I show this slide, in fairness, even fit people die eventually. So if we carried out the follow-up long enough, of course, we would have events in, in that uh, 11 met and higher group as well. But for this given seven-year average, average follow-up in many thousands of patients, we didn't have any events in that group. Again, suggesting how important fitness is for um, predicting health outcomes. Um, these are some other data from our lab um, from a few years back. It shows the age-adjusted multivariate predictors of mortality among clinical variables, physical activity patterns, and other exercise test responses. And it's a nice example of what we've found over the years. If you look at the list of risk, of, uh, risk factors here, smoking, ischemic responses on the treadmill test, diabetes, you can include history of heart failure, history of MI, uh, high cholesterol level, um, history of hypertension, and so on. The most powerful predictor of risk in our veteran population is exercise capacity. And you can see that up on the top there. That was the most significant predictor of mortality. The second most predictor of risk was how active you are during your adulthood life. So, and I'll just arrow these in here. Those two things, they're very important in our veteran population, and but they're not the things that tend to get very much attention from clinicians. And even our clinicians, our cardiology fellows, they oversee our exercise tests, and they're really focused on ST depression, imaging procedures, getting patients with a cath lab, as they say, fixing the plumbing and things like that. But we should at least be counseling patients on physical activity. All right, so then why should we encourage our patients in the public to become more physically active? Well, I've said it, uh, uh, some of the reasons are that uh, because fitness is very important and physical activity develops fitness. But we also know from surveys that physical inactivity is the most prevalent risk factor, but it gets the least amount of attention from health professionals. Now, I showed you that slide from the Lancet study showing that um, physical inactivity is a more prevalent risk factor now than, than smoking for the first time. We know also from surveys, and a lot of people have been looking at this, uh, most of the Western world is too sedentary. And I'll give you some examples of this. 
you're all aware because you're uh, ACSM members, I'm sure, the minimal recommend recommendations for physical activity, they come from the World Health Organization, the European Society of Cardiology, the AHA, ACSM, C uh, CDC, Institute of Medicine, um, and, and so on. They come from all over the place. And in fact, on the bottom, I've just um, I animated in here some countries that um, I've either been to or had association with and, and worked with. They all have a health ministry of some type that has a physical acti a guideline on physical activity and health. And they're all based on our United States Surgeon General's report from the mid 90s that basically says this. All individuals should attempt to accumulate 30 minutes of moderate activity on most, if not all, days of the week. And that's where that 150 minutes a week comes from that you're all familiar with. The guideline also says that additional health benefits can be gained through greater amounts of physical activity. Now, that sounds like a very modest recommendation to, to many people. And, and many people, most people would say, well, 30 minutes of moderate activity, such as walking, well, that's nothing. Everybody gets that. It's actually not true, as I'll show you in a moment. But the thinking is that that modest investment in activity, if we could get the public to do that, it would have major health outcome benefits. In fact, 30 minutes of daily activity, that 150 minutes a week that you're all familiar with, that equates to 20 to 40% reductions in cardiovascular and all-cause morbidity and mortality. So a small investment in, in physical activity has a huge health outcome benefit. So what's the problem then? Well, this is a recent um, publication from the CDC showing the percentage of adults meeting the federal physical activity guidelines for aerobic and muscle strengthening activities over the last 20 years. And you, as you can see, uh, somewhere between 20, going back to the 1990s up until 2016, somewhere between 15 and 20% of Americans meet that guideline. Um, so we're too sedentary. Now, um, wherever I'm traveling, I happen to be in Italy, so I pulled, up, uh, pulled out this slide. It's from the um, Italian Ministry of Health, and it shows that um, it's a 2016 publication, and it shows that 36% of Italian adults meet the recommended physical activity guidelines. So wherever I've gone, or you can go on the web and look at PubMed and pull this up, or Google Scholar, you can see this sort of thing from any advanced country. And in fact, people who look at this sort of thing for a living are um, really sounding the alarm bells about the developing countries now as well, uh, China, uh, Brazil, India, because the populations are so large there, and they're a few years behind us, but um, the problem that the problems that they're going to have or they're starting to have now, um, our problems will pale next to what we're, 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 we're beginning to see in those developing countries. All right, so this is a little bit of a, a complicated slide, but it's something recent that kind of caught my attention, and I thought I would show this. Um, this is a nice uh, paper where they looked at about 12 different countries where they could gather all of the data that they could looking at physical activity patterns. So over the last, going back as long as they could. For the United States, we have data going back to the mid 1960s. So you know it's nearly 50 years or so worth of data. And they projected out to um, 2030. So, and all those lines in there are a little bit complicated, but I want you to uh, focus on the vertical line graph there on the top. Um, and it shows that in the mid 1960s, the met hours per week there, you can see that number, it's 200, and I actually can't see it from here, but my glasses, I need a new prescription and the, the slide is 20 feet away, but I think that's, um, 235 or something like that. And then move forward, see how that's gone down or, and will continue to go down to 2030. And you can see how far our met hours, and you know, you know what a met hour is. That's that metric that epidemiologic studies use for uh, physical activity. It combines exercise intensity and duration. You can see how far that's gone down. And in fact, that shows a 50% reduction in energy expenditure over the last 50 years. And then I'd like you just to focus on the solid black line there. That shows the 
average hours spent sedentary from the 1960s until now and up to 2030. And you can see that that's gone up by close to 30%. So we're just simply not as active as we were um, in decades previous and certainly uh, generations previous to the current one. I um, decided to throw in the Brazilian one here. It's kind of interesting. It just goes back to 2002 where they had data available and it shows the met hours there. You can see the number on the screen and how far that's gone down steadily up until um, more recent years there. That actually represents a 30% reduction in physical activity patterns or met hours from physical activity. So, and Brazil is a major, very populous developing country. So you can see the problem there. And look also at the solid line there. That, that showed the solid black line shows the hours spent sedentary um, since 2002. Just going back that 16 years ago and how fast that's gone up in this one developing country. So we have this problem. Um, one of the things, um, one of the problems this leads to is a growth in worldwide prevalence of overweight and obesity. And this is a recent paper. I thought this showed this nicely. You can see the list of advanced countries there on the uh, upper left corner. But also know going back to the 1970s, uh, the United States is on the top there. Not surprisingly, everybody knows that. Followed closely by the UK in those blue circles. And then I'm in Italy, and you can see Italy's in the middle somewhere there. But what it shows, I mean, the key point is that all of these advanced countries are becoming heavier. The prevalence of overweight and obesity is growing. And you can see that, take the United States again, where we have the most data, it goes back until the mid 1970s, 40 some percent of Americans were overweight or obese in the 1970s, and now, uh, closer to today, up to 2020, that number is about 70%. So you can see the problem. When we see an increase in overweight or obesity, we also see a parallel increase in diabetes, as you know. This shows the prevalence of overweight and obesity in Europe, and I'm using this one um, as an example because I'm in Europe doing several talks here. But you can see the European Union over there on the left side in that left bar the about 60% of Europeans are now overweight and obese. And you can see there's slight differences between the countries there, but basically they're right behind the United States in terms of overweight and obesity. And you can see what's happened with this evolution. You know, this is just 20 years. Uh, what's happened, our um, electronics have gotten smaller and we've gotten bigger from 1990 to, to 2008. Um, I want to make one other point um, here. I think this is a really important and a really interesting study. It was done a few years ago, but it shows the prevalence of Americans meeting the minimal activity guidelines by self-report. This comes from the CDC also. And you can see in males and females, it's fairly generous. It's about 50%, a little bit less as you get older of people who meet the guidelines. And you know, that depends how you ask the questions and how you define being physically active and things like that. So the surveys differ a little bit, but you can see when you ask people, about 50% of them report being physically active enough to meet the guidelines. And then when you hook them up with an accelerometer and you, make, uh, you look at this objectively, using objective data, less than 5% of men and, and women are actually meeting the guidelines or actually physically active. So you can see that, you know, all of these surveys and, you know, I showed you a couple of them, you know, we may be between 20 and 50% of meeting those guidelines, depending what survey you see. We probably exaggerate uh, how physically active we are and we're probably more sedentary than we actually think we are by those surveys. All right, so fitness provides risk information beyond traditional risk factors. And, and how do we know that? Well, there's a statistic that's new. It's called Net Reclassification Improvement, or NRI. And uh, it was developed maybe 12 years ago by a statistician in, um, at Harvard. And uh, it's very clever. It, it looks at how frequently 
correct reclassification of risk occurs versus incorrect reclassification by adding a new variable to a model. So in other words, in the context of what we're talking about here, it addresses this question. Does fitness more accurately stratify risk when added to traditional risk factors? <clears throat> and we looked at this in about 21,000 is something we published last year from the Veterans Exercise Testing Study. But uh, we looked at about 21,000 uh, subjects free of heart failure over, you know, between 1987 and 2014. Of those, during that follow-up, about 1,900 subjects developed heart failure over a mean of 12 years of follow-up. We looked at reclassific reclassification characteristics of fitness relative to standard clinical risk factors using net reclassification improvement. And we found that low fitness was the strongest predictor of risk among clinical and exercise test variables. Now that's important because we always equate hypertension with developing heart failure or smoking or previous MI. But in our population, again, low fitness out predicts the usual variables in, in terms of using at least heart failure as, as the outcome. And the reason we looked at heart failure too, heart failure is really important. It's that one um, cardiovascular disease that's increasing in prevalence and it costs, costs our system as it does any system, a tremendous amount of money. Um, when we added fitness to the standard risk factors, that is smoking, hypertension, obesity, other things we know are related to heart failure, adding fitness, resulted in, net, in a net reclassification improvement of 37%. In other words, 37% of the patients who were wrongly classified as being high risk were correctly reclassified. And that's really the, the um, benefit of that statistic. And that's shown here, the 37% uh, net reclassification improvement in, in the entire population. Classifies patients correctly up and down into and out of risk categories, so, but it ended up with a positive 37%, which was the key finding. So in other words, 37% of the cohort was correctly reclassified into higher low risk categories by adding fitness to standard risk factors. So another important reason to measure fitness. These are the relative risks of heart failure incidence between the quintiles of fitness with the least fit group, that's less than six mets, that left-hand bar there, that's the reference group. So, so if you look at that, the risk is 1.0, and you go down to low fit, moderate fit, fit, and high fit. So it shows that high fit subjects have about a 76% reduction in risk for developing heart failure compared to the least fit group. And again, you can see the gradient going down as you become more fit for risk of heart failure. All right, we also found uh, as part of the study a 19% lower incidence of heart failure per MET achieved. So again, one MET improvement in exercise capacity resulted in a major reduction in risk. All right, so um, <clears throat> just to let me just go back here. So I talked about fitness, but I wanna say a word about physical activity patterns and reclassification of risk. Physical activity patterns, of course, it's different than fitness. They're related. Activity is the thing that develops fitness, but phys uh, physical activity pattern, of course, is a behavior, and fitness is an attribute that has a lot of, uh, has a genetic component to, to it, as you know, um, as well. But we looked at physical activity patterns also using this reclassification statistic. Um, so this was about 7,000 veterans who underwent exercise testing for clinical reasons. And at the time of the test, we asked our patients, are you physically active or do you meet these minimal guidelines? And so the cardiology fellow, the physician who's there overseeing the test with our technician can just take a moment as part of the history and physical, ask this question, do you exercise three or more times weekly enough to feel short of breath feel your heart thumping or work up a sweat. So just that simple question, we considered the patients who answered yes to that question, generally speaking, they met the minimal guidelines on activity. We followed these subjects for a mean of 11 years of um, 11 plus minus six years. And uh, we found this, this is the net reclassification improvement again. So if we set the two circled uh, rows there, 
Baseline risk factors, that's the reference group, and that includes the usual risk factors. Age, body mass index, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, smoking, and diabetes. All of those things we know are related to mortality. And then if we add physical activity to that, that's shown here, we get a 23% reclassification of risk. In other words, again, 23% of patients who were wrongly reclassified as high risk are now correctly reclassified because we asked this simple question about activity. Then when we add fitness, we add exercise capacity to physical activity patterns and we get an overall improvement in risk of 43%. So it suggests to us that the usual risk factors, they've been great in everything since the risk factor concept was developed in 1964 by the American Heart Association, but we've been missing two important risk factors that are strongly related to health outcomes. All right, and these are relative risks for, uh, for a classification of activity at the time of the treadmill test in this study. Um, and as you can see, when we did a longer questionnaire, the athletic subjects over there in the reference group on the right side, and patients who report to us being sedentary, they say, well, at the time of their exercise test, well, doctor, you know, I really can't think of anything that I do. Um, you know, that's about 30% of our population of veterans. That's not too much different from the rest of the United States. But that group has, when compared to the most active subjects, has 4.3 times the risk of mortality. Note also, if you're minimally active, if you go from that sedentary group to the minimally active group, you cut your risk by about 60%. Note also that the active group, that's the group that by our questionnaire, we consider that they met the minimal guidelines on activity. So that minimal activity group there doesn't even meet the recommended guidelines. They're just a little bit active and they've cut their risk by, by 60%. So if we can get the public or get our patients to be even a little bit active or improve their fitness a little bit, you can see it goes a long way. All right, so let me just say a word about uh, fitness and healthcare costs. Um, this is something we've been um, interested in and, and chasing down healthcare costs in the uh, veterans healthcare system and the computers there where we have, it's a contained system where we can um, get this information. It's not always so easy to get, but we get their healthcare costs and um, we control for age and diabetes and obesity and all the other risk factors. And we come up with uh, an association between fitness and healthcare costs. And this is a paper that we published earlier this year. Um, it's about 10,000 subjects from uh, our VA uh, in Palo Alto combined with the Washington DC VA. Um, this is from the VETS cohort, which I explained. We've been following patients for about 30 years. We looked at total healthcare costs between 2005 and 2012, the period where we had these data available. And we expressed fitness as a percentage of their age predicted peak METs achieved using a, a population specific um, prediction equation that we have in, in, in veterans that we've used over the years. And you can see the um, low fit group is less than 60% of their age predicted value. And over on the right, the more than 100%. So that would be the high fit group. And this shows the association between healthcare costs and exercise capacity. Um, the y-axis there is cost per patient per year. And then exercise capacity as a percent predicted is on the bottom there. And you can see there's a dramatic inverse relation between healthcare costs and your fitness level. And again, this is controlled for age and other factors so that the unfit group there on the high left corner, those aren't just the oldest and sickest patients um, who are, have metabolic syndrome or whatever. We did our best to control for those other risk factors. And this shows the mean healthcare cost by quartile of fitness um, with the cost there on the, on the bars on the, the left side and the percentage of age predicted exercise capacity on the bottom. Um, you can see that the least fit group costs a lot more than the high fit group. Now, this is a little bit um, misleading because 
you know, two of these bars, one bar versus another, might just have more subjects in it, and so there may be more costs. But what we also did was this. We looked at mean total healthcare costs per patient per year. So then the comparison's a little bit more fair, but you can still see there's a gradient for lower costs as you become more fit, as you go from left to right. So a couple of key points here. The age-adjusted costs in the least fit quartile were 35% higher than subjects in the fittest quartile. Heart failure, in this case, was the strongest predictor of healthcare costs. And that's not surprising. I mentioned that's the one cardiovascular disease that's increasing now. It's very expensive to treat, so that didn't surprise anybody. But fitness was the second uh, most powerful uh, predictor of healthcare costs. And that surprises our clinicians and others. You know, you'd think it'd be smoking. People would say something like that, but it's not, it's fitness. Change in fitness category, just going from one category to another, from the left to the right, that results in about a 4,200 annual cost reduction. And the annual cost reduction was about $1,500 or $1,600 per met achieved. So again, if you can get your patients to improve, or the public, to improve by one met, you can have a major impact on health outcomes and healthcare costs. All right, so, so let me summarize uh, by saying a, a few things. First, as I showed you from some of the data from the United States and around the world, we're far too sedentary. And I think you as members of the ACSM, you know, you have an important role uh, in this, in talking to patients, talking to family and friends and the public about um, their physical activity patterns and encouraging people to be more physically active. Cardiorespiratory fitness should be treated as any other traditional vital sign. We know that at least fitness should be considered along with the usual risk factors in that risk paradigm. Um, and we should discuss this with patients and measure it when we can. There are various ways to measure fitness without doing a complete cardiopulmonary exercise test. There are non-exercise estimates of fitness. There are simple tests we can do that are highly correlated with um, the, the standard measures of fitness. So, so we need to be doing that. If nothing else, we should be talking to patients about their activity level. Higher cardiorespiratory fitness is associated with better health outcomes, uh, as I showed. Higher fitness is associated with significantly lower healthcare costs. And uh, I think there, one important point is that, you know, if we can't convince our clinicians that we work with um, to talk to patients about activity, hospital systems should be very interested in this in it, because of the fact that it's strongly related to lower healthcare costs. And then finally, um, you know, I finish every talk with this, with this comment. Um, physical activity counseling should occur during every clinical encounter, regardless of whether it's an exercise test or just your usual clinic visit. We all need to um, take part in that and we need to be encouraging our colleagues in, in clinics or health centers or health systems to be uh, counseling patients on, on physical activity. Now, I'll uh, finish here with just another one final comment. And you've all seen a version of this, I think. Um, you all know that um, we once walked on all fours. We, we evolved over the uh, generations and thousands of years. We then uh, walked upright. We were hunter-gatherers for much of our history where we needed, it was required to be physically active to survive, to feed ourselves. And then we've evolved today. And um, <clears throat> this guy on the um, right there is an example of someone who you know, we don't even have to get out of our cars anymore to feed ourselves. Um, and I have many patients who don't, um, and that, that's a big problem now. So the argument has been, or the discussion has been that maybe we should have thought of this sooner, or maybe mankind somewhere along the Cro-Magnon period should have thought ahead. And this uh, poor guy there um, on the bottom is, is uh, discovered just that. And, and he says, go back, go back, we really screwed up. So. I will stop there. Um, thank you again for listening. And I can see there may be some questions on the screen. So I'll go ahead and, um, and um, try to take some of these questions. 
Okay, so the first one is, what is the shortest and most accurate way to test aerobic capacity among a general population in a work setting? Well, in a work setting especially, I think that one of the non-exercise test um, estimates of fitness, um, they've been shown to work uh, very well. One that's been widely used and um, was widely referenced is from uh, Ulrich Wisloff's group in Norway. It's a, it's a good one. It was published, what, maybe four or five years ago. It's just sitting and asking a, a, co a, um, a, a, a healthy person or a patient, you ask a series of questions, including information about their physical activity pattern. You come up with an estimate that correlates very well with um, having put them on the treadmill. So I would recommend that. But look for those. Um, there's a, a number of these non-exercise test estimates. The next thing I would use is one of the uh, submaximal walking tests. Um, there are, uh, for patients, you know, there are 10 meter walking tests. There are 1K walking tests. There are a field test that you can use along with series of questions. So I would look for something like that. Um, so the question, in the developed countries, who has the highest percent of population that meets the required physical activity guidelines? And what are the factors that are contributing to the success of that country's population? So it's a tough question because there's um, a lot of these surveys. Um, so too many of them to try to separate one country from another you can find different results. What I can say is, I can generalize and say that the United States is now behind uh, most of Europe, for example, in terms of physical activity. There's a reason why that slide I showed, why we're the most overweight country. Um, so I would say, and there's a, leave the question up just a second, there's a second part of that. Um, yeah. What are the factors that are contributing to the success of that country's population? Let me just say one notable thing, a place that I've been, uh, well, I'll say two places. Um, uh, Denmark, number one, and the efforts that they've invested on uh, their livable environment and exercise-friendly environments, they've put a major um, impact. They're, they're, they're building the built environment, as, as they say, is terrific there. And they're aware of these problems with growing prevalence of diabetes and obesity and inactivity. So they've done something about it. The other one that stands out is, is Australia and uh, the, the built environment there where they've had success with that. All right, so how much do you believe technological advancements have hurt our society in regards to physical activity? Well, and I'm smiling because that's a lot of it. I mean, well, you can go back to the, the guys on the screen there and how we've evolved. Um, you know, there was no technology when we began to walk upright. Now we drive everywhere and, and now we, we don't have to, um, I'm old enough to remember that you had to actually get out of your car to open your garage door or walk over to the TV to change the channel or whatever it might be. People have quantified that, all of those simple things that technology um, has done where we don't get up, we don't get up off the couch. And someone, it seems to me, um, calculated that that was something like in their population, it was nine pounds a year or something like that was the, was the analysis that they came up with. So yes, absolutely, technological advancements have, have um, caused this in a lot of ways. Um, Okay, so the next one is ACSM members, the information provided most likely only affirms what we've already seen in our practice. And that's absolutely true. However, I'm more curious in the ways this information can be spread to the general public. How is it possible to show this information with the general public in a way, an avenue and, um, that they will trust and listen to? And it's a really good question because we've known this for a long time and you and I as ACSM members, as you said, we've known this for a long time, and yet we continue to have a problem. We continue to be more sedentary. There was some data three or four years ago that started to show that the obesity problem was leveling off, and now there's some recent data to show that that's probably not true. So we, we have this, this problem. So, um, how can we spread this information? Well, 
you know, a, a group of us, um, you know, we petitioned the uh, HA to get two, two of these statements out recently, and one of the ones is the one that I first showed. I think that's a way to get information to the healthcare community and to the public. Uh, you, you hope that something like that's helpful. In fact, through that statement, fitness is now considered the sixth primary risk factor. So, you know, um, there were three in 1964. In 1994, the AHA added physical inactivity. In 1998, they added obesity. And now fitness is one of the primary risk factors. We can take that to patients. We can take that to the public. But, uh, you know, other than that, I think um, <clears throat> you and I have to take responsibility. And uh, it took a long time for uh, smoking to decline. Uh, we knew it was bad for there was a Surgeon General's report in 1964 that made this statement. It took years, decades to get that point across. And now smoking is decreasing, but it may take that. I hope it doesn't take that long, but it may take something like that, but you and I all have to work on it. Okay, so um, many health insurance plans add surcharges to beneficiaries who currently smoke. Could you see insurers start to add a surcharge for those classified as low fit? Um, you know, someone asked me that actually earlier today. Um, and, you know, it, it might work, but the people like the ACLU and others would, would go crazy about that. Um, for the moment, you healthy people, myself, I'm still reasonably healthy, we're going to continue to pay for people who are smoking. And they, they tried adding a surcharge to people who smoke. How do you classify smokers and how much they smoke? That's tough. People lie. They say, I don't smoke, but they do. Can you classify them fitness? I don't see that happening um, in the near future. What do you think about the muscular strength? Why cardiorespiratory fitness could help in reducing the risk of mortality than muscular strength? Okay, I think, let me read that second part again. Why cardiorespiratory fitness, or why could it help more in reducing the risk of mortality than muscular strength? Well, there are studies from ACLS and others that show that muscular strength also is an important risk factor, and we should be measuring that. That's part of fitness. That should be um, part of what you measure. That's what we measure in our rehab programs. And, and I think that should be part of it. So I think muscular strength is critically important. Studies have shown something simple, like maybe you don't have to walk a patient over to the gym, to the chest press or leg press or whatever, and go through that. But a hand grip dynamometer is a good surrogate for overall upper body strength, for example. So you can do something like that. So, so I feel very strongly about muscular strength, and I think it's really important. Um, okay, what tips do you have for exercise professional entrepreneurs looking to open a referral-based medical fitness center? <clears throat> so it's a tough question because I have some friends who've tried to do this, and they failed. And um, you know, it's it's a question of how are you going to get, we don't, you know, we don't have that insurance base behind us. It's, um, you know, it was just last year that CMS, and I think most of you are from the United States, so I'll use that as an example. But um, CMS just one year ago approved rehabilitation peripheral vas for peripheral vascular disease for 36 sessions and you know, it took years and years for people to fight that. It was just four years ago that CMS approved um, cardiac rehabilitation for uh, uh, heart failure, as you know. So you're not gonna get that kind of support except from people who are gonna pay out of pocket. And then you're gonna be, um, and I support what you're doing completely, but you're gonna be competing with 24 hour fitness and Nautilus and people like that. So it's gonna be tough. Okay, so I see many patients are turned off by exercise recommendations. What do you think we need to do more of to remind exercise trainers to work at the patient's level to go in small steps from there? Okay, so the last thing I would give a um, patient is the ACSM guidelines or the, this AHA statement. There, very few of them are gonna read it. But 
with our patients, we start with small steps. What you can give them is a pedometer. And, you know, I'll see you in a week or come back Friday or send me an email. How are you doing? Start with 5,000 steps and talk to them about how important the 10,000 step concept is. Um, we need to do more of count, more patient counseling. Most patients don't even get counseled by healthcare professionals. So we need to do more um, counseling. We need to talk to patients. And um, as an exercise trainer or an exercise professional, you're at the at you're in the trenches doing that. So um, I would start with small steps. M many patients and also the public they won't want they won't, don't even want to deal with an uh, accelerometer, but get them to walk. Give them a seven-day activity recall, something like that, that they'll do and bring back to you. So I would recommend that. And then um, I think this is the last question. Do you believe the limited access to fresh and um, fresh and non-processed foods play a major role in the need for fitness capacity increase? So, <clears throat> so here's what I think about that. I think that study after study has shown that um, if you eat more whole grains, less processed foods, fewer sugars, you're better off. That alone, uh, independent of fitness, um, has a major role in uh, improving health outcomes. And everybody says the Mediterranean diet and all of that, because it has a lot of whole grains and olive oil, oils, fats that we know are good for you, and uh, non-processed foods. But it doesn't have to be a diet. It just means that you just have to Make sure most of your plate at each meal is a whole grain or fresh fruit and vegetable. And that will help people to maintain their weight. If you maintain your weight, you'll help, that'll help you improve your fitness level. Um, so, so that's what I tell patients. Just think in terms of, you know, there's a million diets and a, millions of books, and I tell people to stay away from them. Just eat more non-processed foods. You'll be better off. Okay, so uh, an, another question. If physical activity amounts are decreasing over the decades and cardiorespiratory fitness is a strong predictor of mortality, how come life expectancy in developed countries is continually increasing? Well, now you'll have to ask a real epidemiologist that question, but um, uh, life expectancy is increasing for all kinds of reasons. We have better medical care we know in the past, you know, there were infectious diseases. We've taken, in advanced countries, we've taken care of many infectious or most infectious diseases. We don't have to worry about that uh, anymore. We have lowered the smoking rate. Um, we've done a lot of things in healthcare that, that account for li a higher life expectancy. So, but as people are living longer, they're getting older, but they're, you know, they're not eating the right foods and they're not exercising. So we're seeing that um, gains in weight and lowering fitness for that reason. Okay, so would you say what we need is experts from different fields to work together? We often focus on what is more important, smoking cessation, eating better, doing more exercise instead of multidisciplinary uh, interventions. Absolutely, and any rehab program or uh, any health prevention program, adult fitness program, it has to be multidisciplinary. And that's what I try to do. We bring in the nutrition groups, the smoking cessation people at our hospital, and they're all part of what we're doing. And that's critically important. Um, telling someone just to go do more exercise isn't enough. And if you run a program, if it's a rehab program or a prevention program, you need to bring in all of those people that, that can help you do this. It's got to be multidisciplinary. I completely agree. <clears throat> okay, so high intensity interval training is popular right now. Short cardio sessions have led many to turn away from moderate intensity due to duration. Um, my clients still do not do the minimum, either vigorous or moderate intensity. It seems near impossible to get them to exercise more. I don't believe more HIT is the answer. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the um, HIT uh, the HIT concept has um, been you know, very popular. And again, I'll mention the Norwegian study, uh, Wisloff, and that 19, uh, 2007 study, which generated a lot more interest in this and another um, whole slew of studies. Uh, many of them are um, 
show better results, but there's some studies that don't. And the most recent one study on HIT from Munich showed it didn't help patients with cardiovascular disease in rehab. It was a big multi-center trial and they didn't have good luck with it. So um, telling someone in your, and I'm not sure if you're talking about a prevention program or rehab, but telling someone to go out and do this high intensity work, um, yeah, I don't think that's the purpose of, of HIT. Um, we use a little bit of HIT you know, in our patients. Once someone's experienced, they've been in a program for a while and they can tolerate it. I, we bring that in, but it's not our standard prescription um, for all patients, especially you know, a month post-MI or, or whatever. So um, let's see what happens with high intensity training. I think it has a place. I think it does some really good things. I think it's efficient, but it's not for, <clears throat> it's not for all patients, I believe. And I'm seeing the end on the screen, so, so thank you very much.